Nice Thank to you. meet you. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's certainly an honor to be here. I'm really excited to share with you what I see and what a lot of people see is the future of reproduction. So as background, I'm a urologist focused on male reproduction. So I give sort of similar theme talks to a lot of my patients every day who are men. So every year I see thousands of men trying to become fathers. But these same themes also apply to women. And so for that reason, these really apply to all of humanity. And so uh, let's get started. And I want to start by talking before you talk about the future, where we are right now. So what is reproduction? And this is a nice cartoon depiction of that. So what we can see here uh, is a female reproductive tract. We have the ovaries, fallopian tubes, uh, and uterus. And so reproduction begins with ovulation, where an egg is released. That's the, the red circle there. And then the fallopian tube, hopefully it meets sperm. Fertilization occurs, then it goes through several rounds of cell division, becoming an embryo. And eventually, forming a blastocyst, the most advanced form of the embryo, where it implants into the uterus. Let's see, and let's look at that in a little more detail here. So here's a video of that. So we can see at the bottom the sperm coming up, penetrating the zona pellucida, combining with the cytoplasm of the oocyte. The DNA will mix. You'll see the two pronuclei form several rapid rounds of cell division. And this video is really remarkable because it's possible because of one of the most marvelous advances in all of medicine, all of science the last 50 years, and that's in vitro fertilization taking those processes that we showed in the first slide and then being able to do those in a laboratory, in a dish. And this is the seminal publication for that achievement of in vitro fertilization by Patrick Sebto, Robert Edwards, published in The Lancet, one of the leading medical journals in all the world in 1978, so about 40 years ago. And certainly medicine appreciated it, but really, let's see here, we could advance, really all of, the world appreciated it as well. Thank you. <clears throat> and so you can see here the front page headlines all over the world. This is Louise Brown being born. And you can see here several years later with uh, Dr. Edwards um, standing for a photo. And again, everybody recognized the magnificence of this discovery. And in 2010, the Nobel Prize was awarded. Is there maybe another one? Um, you can see here Mary Edwards, this is Dr. Edwards' uh, wife, accepting the award on his behalf. Unfortunately, he was ill at the time of presentation. But this has really been a remarkable achievement. And so for our patients, we think of IVF as sort of the ultimate form um, of technologies that we can offer our patients. Let's see. I can see what Dr. Debray was going through here. Yeah, I don't know if maybe we try a different one. So what do we need, though, for IVF? Well, <clears throat> during normal ovulation, a single egg is produced, or sometimes two. But for IVF, we need a lot more than that. We want a lot of shots on goal. So let's talk about some of the details involved in IVF and some of the barriers to wide adoption of it. So for IVF, we want several eggs so we can produce several embryos so we can pick the best ones to ultimately generate a child. So one or two eggs is actually not enough. So we need to stimulate the ovary. To do that, we do give powerful hormones to women. And you can see an ultrasound depiction of, an, of a stimulated ovary with all the different cysts representing follicles that have eggs in them. And so this is somewhat unpleasant. And ultimately, we have to retrieve these eggs. So this is a procedure that women go through. Under ultrasound guidance, a small needle is placed inside the ovary to actually retrieve, aspirate each of these individual eggs. Also somewhat unpleasant. And then ultimately, what needs to happen is you have to bring sperm and eggs together in a dish. And so for IVF, we need tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sperm for each individual egg to be able to achieve fertilization and ultimately embryo development in a child. But another remarkable achievement then for reproductive medicine is ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So we'll see a video of that here. So we have uh, a catheter holding an oocyte, and then we have a small needle with a sperm, maybe you can appreciate that inside, that's gonna inject the single sperm into the egg. So for normal unassisted reproduction, we need millions of sperm to be able to achieve fertilization. But here, with, the, uh, with modern technology, all we need is a single sperm. And so you can think about that, how remarkably we're lowering the barrier for reproduction. So this allows millions more uh, infertile men to be able to become fathers. But for science, as we're gonna learn in the next few, uh, few minutes, it may be difficult to create millions of sperm 
but I think we're actually pretty close to being able to create a single sperm, and now that's really all we need uh, for reproduction. So this is data here from the United States. It's similar in most developed countries, but it shows basically the wide adoption of IVF. So we're looking at the number of IVF cycles and children conceived with IVF over the last 20 years. And it's increased threefold. So since that first publication in 1978, to date, it's estimated that about six and a half million children have been conceived with IVF in the world, which is remarkable. In the United States today, about 1.5% of all births are, con are conceived with IVF. And in other countries where IVF is federally funded, it's much higher. So countries like Denmark, Israel, up to 5 to 10% of all children conceived are done so by IVF. Really remarkable. And what this also tells us is that it's safe. Millions of children are born, and this is a safe process. But ultimately, there's two things that we need for IVF to work. We need gametes. We need sperm, and we need eggs. And unfortunately, not everybody has those. So obviously, as a reproductive urologist, every year I see hundreds of men that don't have sperm. And it's very devastating. Fortunately for many of them with modern techniques, we can obtain sperm in these men, but there's a lot more that we can't. And so there's different reasons for that. There can be congenital causes, something that they're born with, they can't produce sperm. There can also be acquired forms as well. So a poster child for this would be cancer therapies. Chemotherapy, radiation are remarkable for longevity, but obviously they can be devastating for reproduction. And so these themes, themes that I've talked about applying to men also apply to women as well. So there's women that don't have oocytes, they don't have eggs, something they're born with, something perhaps they've acquired through diseases or treatment. But who else doesn't have oocytes? Well, I don't have oocytes. I would guess most of the men in this room don't either, although we don't have to do a poll or a show of hands. Um, <laughs> but in the future, that may actually be possible. So let's talk about how we can do that. How can we generate gametes? I think we're actually a little bit closer than most people appreciate. So this is a nice diagram of how that potentially could work. So first, we're going to focus on the gray side. That's in vivo. That's what actually happened. So at the very top, we have uh, an embryo. This is a blastocyst. And the blue circles, the blue portion, represents the inner cell mass. And these are the cells that are destined to become the fetus, the child, and ultimately us. So these cells are going to become all the cells in our body. And so when we're focusing specifically on gametes, we can kind of see the progression as they go through primordial germ cells and then several sperm precursors, spermatogonia, spermatocytes, spermatids, eventually spermatozoa, which are sperm, and obviously we can use that to be able to have a baby. So what this group decide, uh, describes here is actually doing this process in a laboratory, doing it in vivo, in a dish, in a test tube. So taking these same stem cells, these stem inner cell mass cells, making... Uh, embryonic stem cells, and exposing them to certain conditions, certain factors, and being able to generate sperm in, in vivo. So in vivo gametogenesis, really remarkable. So does this work? Well, let's look at some of the proof of that. So this is a, a publication in Cell, one of the leading scientific journals that we have. And what we can see is these are from embryonic stem cells. This group has generated sperm and then used that to fertilize eggs and generate mice. So on the left, we have male mice, and you can see they're normal and fertile. You can see them with their pups there. Also, these same embryonic uh, stem cell-derived sperm generate female mice that are normal and fertile. You can see their pups here. And so not just focusing on the male side of things, so I don't seem biased as a urologist. Here's the same experiment, but done with oocytes. So in vivo, or in vitro, rather, uh, derived oocytes, and then used to generate normal mice that are fertile. And this same process, to some extent, has happened in humans as well. So taking human embryonic stem cells, and these papers describe the factors, the conditions required to be able to generate sperm and eggs. But there's a problem with embryonic stem cells. So I remember maybe 15 or 20 years ago, there was enormous debate about their use. Obviously, for ethical reasons, a lot of political debate around that. And that's certainly part of it. But there's also, at least from a reproductive standpoint, a logistical issue with that as well. So if I don't have any sperm, but the only way to generate sperm requires embryos, that's a big problem for me. Because if I don't have sperm, how can I generate an embryo? So we need some other ways around this, this issue. How else can we generate sperm if we can't use embryonic stem cells? Well, Shinya Yamanaka came up with a solution for that. Here's a seminal publication in 2006. So he described the creation of what are known as induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells. 
So what he did, what he described is taking these um, differentiated somatic cells, so cells in our body, and being able to turn back the clock so that they become these pluripotent cells that could then be differentiated into anything else. So here the figure I've showed is him taking uh, skin cells from the tail of a mouse and generating a mouse fetus. It's pretty amazing, taking skin cells and being able to turn that into essentially every other cell in an organism. And his group did a similar experiment in people, too. Obviously, for legal and ethical reasons, you can't do the exact same experiment, but he took skin cells and turned it into several other cells in the body. Intestinal cells, neural cells, fat cells, cartilage. Amazing. And I'm not the only one that recognizes it. The Nobel Committee did as well in 2012. Here's him accepting his prize. So from seminal publication 2006, Nobel Prize 2012, that is a remarkably short period of time especially for this award. And it just speaks to the revolutionary nature of this technique, of this technology. So with that, now I think we have all the elements in place to imagine one of the new forms of reproduction that we're gonna see probably in a decade or so. So taking some skin cells, exposing them to certain conditions and factors, and being able to generate sperm and eggs, and then using those then to create a child. And again, who needs that? Well, we talked about infertile couples. There's many that don't have sperm, don't have eggs, so they would need that. But we also talked about another potential application. So for saying sex couples. So for me, I don't have any oocytes, but you can imagine taking skin cells from me and potentially being able to generate it. So if remember from biology, women have two X chromosomes, men have an X and a Y chromosome. So I have all the genes in my body potentially to make oocytes. And I think it may actually be possible in the near term to actually take cells from a man and be able to generate uh, eggs. And actually it works in chickens, interestingly. So you can take stem cells from a male chicken and create eggs, stem cells from a female chicken and create sperm. And so I think it's not too far, hard to imagine this working in mammals too. And some of the, the gene editing techniques uh, that we're going to hear about later on in the day may make some of this even more possible. The other thing to keep in mind with this is that reproductive biologists are obviously interested in using these techniques to make gametes, to make sperm and eggs. But there's lots of other scientists that are interested in iPS cells and optimizing conditions as well to generate, for example, cardiomyocytes after heart attack, neurons after stroke, different neurodegenerative diseases, cartilage after sporting injuries, which I could certainly use. And so with this, as each of these different groups makes these rapid advances, the other groups in other fields can take advantage of this. And so this field is really moving at an exponential rate, and it's really exciting to follow. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some other new forms of reproduction. <clears throat> and this is a fascinating piece written by Jesse Hempel in Time magazine just last year. And she chronicles uh, her brother's journey. So her brother Evan uh, was born a girl and early in life transitioned to become a man. Decided he wanted to become pregnant, so stopped his testosterone therapy. And you can see he was able to achieve. So here he is chest feeding uh, his son. And this is really a, a remarkable story. And he's not the only, uh, this is not the only uh, instance of this. I think as we're learning more about transgender issues, we're seeing more and more uh, of this. And it's, it's really amazing. And I think it does represent another future of reproduction. Now, another thing that I guess we haven't sort of talked about, we've always assumed when we're talking about these new forms of reproduction is that the mother is going to gestate. She's going to carry the children. But in the future, that may not be necessary or may not be done at all for a variety of reasons. So this is hot off the press. This is a publication out of uh, Philadelphia where they describe an ex vivo, completely laboratory-based technique for gestating here a lamb fetus. And what we can see here comparing the left and the right panels is the enormous growth of this fetus. You can see it's almost filling up this artificial womb. You can see the, the accumulation of wool. It's just amazing to think that what we used to think of as only possible inside the body can now be done outside the body. And so it's not hard to imagine then that we may have from very start to finish all of reproduction done in a laboratory. And this is really kind of turning the concept of parenting, I think, along its heads a little bit. And so that then leads to kind of the final concept and some of the legal and ethical uh, concepts surrounding uh, all these new techniques in vitro gametogenesis. So this is an excellent article just published last, uh, last month from the New York Times 
We're looking at some of these, uh, these scenarios and some of the things that we're going to have to think about as these technologies come online in the next decade or so. So one interesting piece that they describe is something known as the Brad Pitt scenario. That's sort of a fun name, but what this imagines is that you can actually take skin cells that are left behind maybe in a hotel room. I don't know for out-of-town guests reading this made me a little bit nervous. And you could take those skin cells and actually generate sperm and then use that to conceive a child. So with that, then what is the obligation for the person that gave those cells? Is there an ethical obligation? Is there a legal obligation, a financial obligation? I think it's actually a little bit uncertain what to do with that. And you know, there is some legal precedent about stealing gametes, and it's a little bit murky about how you would handle these scenarios. So I think that's Another thing that we're going to have to think about probably a little bit quicker uh, than we realize. So I want to just stop there and thank everybody for their attention. So Michael, that was exactly what I wanted to get across. Uh, wow, a sperm without egg, egg without sperm, boys without girls, boys with boys, girls with girls. Uh, Brave new world. Well, yeah, and, and, and families that might be composed or, or are already composed of the sperm donor, the egg donor, and the carrier. Mm -hmm. So we have three parents now. Yeah. yeah. Or you could even imagine one parent. I could give myself, I could give a sperm sample, my, my skin could give the eggs, and I could become a, a parent all by myself. <laughs> what would you call that? I remember a country western song once, it just comes to mind, the refrain was, and I'm my own grandpa. <laughs> Thanks very much, Michael, that was fascinating. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.